to uh, enter into the Glenmore pulpit today. And stand here, young man. I want to pray first and pray you into this. Lord, be with Jeremy. Be with the Word. Thank you, God, that um, that this text, this Scripture, Lord, just leads us and illuminates us. Now, we're asking a blessing on Jeremy and his message from the heart. We're praying this that in then in everything, God, you're to be glorified. If one heart is changed, God, we're going to give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, Glenmore United Methodist Church. Uh, it's an honor to be up here to speak with you all this morning. Uh, again, my name is Jeremy Vanderslice. Um, in your bulletin, there's a brief little synopsis about me. Uh, you know, where, where I've done ministry, uh, seminary I attended, things like that, some of the smaller points. Um, some of the more important things uh, that aren't in there but have been mentioned, my wife Rachel, uh, we've been married for six plus years and uh, she's a speech language pathologist and also a wonderful mom. She's back there with our boys Joey, who is two years old, and, uh, and our son Chase, who is teething right now. He uh, literally this moment. So I apologize for that, but he's uh, actually seven months old, I think, today. So, um, so we're glad uh, to be here with you this morning. Um, you know, as, as a preacher, uh, the first time, and what, well, maybe the last time, depending on how this goes, too, uh, that you go to preach at a church, uh, you spend a lot of time inevitably thinking, you know, what, what is the first sermon I should preach, right? What is the first... Uh, impression that we should give here. And you, you, you spend some time trying to find the, the perfect sermon. You go back through some old sermons, looking, you think about it. And I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it kind of, uh, you know, in the car while I'd be driving, um, at night, laying in bed, just thinking about what, what is the right thing to share. Uh, and then I had this moment where I was sitting in Panera, where I, in Westchester, where I like to do some work, and I'm sitting there and uh, and I just felt like God was saying, you know, Jeremy, in, in the short time you have, uh, share with them what I've been sharing with you. Uh, and I say short time, but unfortunately I realized my watch battery died this morning, so uh, I have no idea how long this is going to go on. I apologize for that. Uh, I was, yeah, I was told there's a clock back there. I was going <laughs> to, these glasses aren't up to date, so uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, but here's the problem. Over the, God's been trying to teach me the same thing over the last two years, right? The same thing over and over and over again. But I have just, I am so hard-headed uh, and, and too naive to easily grasp it, right? He tells me in one way or another way, and I just, I'm, I'm, slow, I'm a slow learner, right? Uh, but that one thing that he's been trying to teach me for, for two years is that I need to recapture real and true, authentic faith in him. That's a little humbling to, to share with you because I went to a Christian high school. I have a seminary degree. I've worked in churches. Uh, a guy I knew uh, used to refer to us, those of us who worked in churches, as professional Christians, right? Uh, getting, getting paid to be a Christian. <laughs> but uh, I was a professional Christian for a little bit. And... Uh, I've been attempting to follow Jesus for the majority of my life. And yet, something that God has been trying to teach me for years now is one of the most basic and, and fundamental tenets of our Christianity, right? And that's faith. Simply faith. But here's what I found over the years of taking seminary courses, of of reading books, of writing sermons, and, and learning theology, my understanding of God grew. Right? My understanding of Jesus grew, but my faith in God diminished. My understanding grew, but my faith diminished. My faith in God was replaced with faith in what I know about God, faith in what I can understand, faith in my own beliefs, faith ultimately not in Him, but in myself. And I actually don't think I'm alone in facing this. I think it's actually an issue that we face quite a bit in, as a church in America today. As Christianity, we, we kind of find ourselves under attack from various different ways in the church uh, in America today. And, and 
inevitably we end up feeling like we have to defend God. And in order to defend God, we need to, to, to know everything and have correct thinking and, and have, have a perfect understanding. And so, uh, you know, we get, uh, we start relying more on our own reasoning and our own understanding. We become obsessed with it, with our own experiences. And even in the church, we've kind of worked so hard to fit God into a, a box that we can understand. Something that we can fully comprehend. When we think of God, we've worked to make him something that we can reason, that we can understand, that we can easily explain to others because we're under attack and we need to defend ourselves. And so we need to rationalize God in some ways. And it's kind of no wonder that we, as a church, have, have teenagers who go off to college. And many of them leave their faith when they get to college and I think the reason is because they hear and experience and, and are confronted with things that are different than what they've grown up learning. And instead of being able to sit in that tension and kind of figuring it out, they say, well, then if this is different from what I know, different from my reasoning, different from what I understand or, or, or have experienced, then, then inevitably one of these things cannot be true. And if one of these things cannot be true, uh, maybe it's God. Because we've tied God so tightly to our own thinking, to our own ability to reason and understand. We've tied him to, to our own political thoughts, to our own educational thoughts, to our economic thoughts, to man-made things, to our ability to reason. And just like those college kids, sometimes when we come up against something that doesn't seem to make sense with what we believe we know, we're kind of stuck in a corner. Things like COVID-19, things like the immense political turmoil that we face almost daily now in this country, right? Hurricanes, floods, people losing their jobs, or even just the daily day-to-day -day grind of being a person. We find ourselves sometimes saying, you know what, what I'm experiencing now doesn't really line up with my reasoning and my thinking and understanding and what I've been taught, and so um, maybe something here isn't true. Because, you see, I don't think it's bad to want to know, actually at all, bad to want to know or understand or reason and, and to know God and to understand theology and different things. But what we've done is we've become so obsessed where we've lost any ability as people to sit inside of the tension, the uncomfortableness, the unknown, and yet still have faith. To sit inside of what we can't comprehend, of what doesn't make sense with what we're experiencing, and what we know, and sit inside of that and say, you know what, I have no idea, and yet I still have faith. We've lost that. And the writer of Hebrews, as we read this morning, defines uh, faith in the first verse of Hebrews. Mine's a, the, out of the ESV, so it's a little bit different, but it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Notice the insurance is what is hoped for, not in what is known or understood or reasoned, but hoped. And what are those things that the writer of Hebrews is talking about? Well, your homework is to continue on in, in Hebrews 11, to read all the examples that are given of, of faith. And I think you'll notice a pattern in each of the examples given, that the faith the things that are hoped for and unseen, the assurance is in God and his promise. Not in any man-made thing or any person's thinking, but in God and his promises. The faith is in the reality that God is good and he has planned the restoration for those who trust in him. Their faith was not the people that, that, that are, are spoken about in, in Hebrews 11, their faith not in what they could see or experience or reason. It's not in faith of, of knowing everything that's going to happen, what's happening, why it's happening, and understanding all of that. It's just simply faith in God and faith in his goodness and his promise. 
And it, and it might seem like I'm, I'm splitting hairs here a little bit, talking about uh, the distinction between having faith actually in God and faith in our own ability to reason and understand about God. It might seem like I'm splitting hairs, but ultimately I think it matters quite a bit because our own faith in our own ability to comprehend God ultimately will lead to a dead end. To something where we, we get stuck, pushed in a corner, where something doesn't line up with what we know. And it leads to a dead end. And why is that? Well, another passage we read, Isaiah 55. Verses 8 to 9. For my thoughts, this is the Lord speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Think about that. For as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are my thoughts and my ways higher and apart from yours. On Christmas Day, uh, NASA and the European Space Agency launched a new uh, space telescope. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. I believe James Webb was a, a NASA director, or scientist back in the 60s that it was named after. But uh, this, this space telescope is going to be updated to take the place of the Hubble Space Telescope. And, and the telescope is going to be able to see a million miles into our, our uh, universe, into our galaxy, right? A million miles. For reference, the Earth is almost 25,000 miles in circumference. If you cut the earth and laid it out, it would be 40 earths cut open and laid out that this telescope will be able to see. It'll be able to see further than we've ever seen and, and help us to grasp and understand. And you know what that telescope will not see? The heavens, right? It won't see uh, uh, or grasp a picture of that because as, as far as, as outside of our comprehension that the heavens are from the earth, so is God's ways and his thinking compared to ours. That, that's beyond being able to understand, right? You just kind of write it up and say, okay, I, I can't fully grasp that. And that's why our own reasoning, faith in our own thinking, will always lead to a dead end. Right? Because God's thoughts and ways are so far beyond ours. So then, okay, we've given the, we've understood that, that we can't ultimately just put our faith in our own ability and our own understanding. So then how do we recapture true faith in God? How, Jeremy, do you uh, get assurance in the hope of Jesus Christ and in the God we cannot see? How do you get back to that? Well, another uh, passage we read is in from the book of Job. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever spent some time inside of the book of Job, but it is a tough book. It's not only long, it's a long book, but it's tough. Uh, and I don't have time necessarily to lay out a whole synopsis of it now, but I encourage you to go spend some time in, in the, the battle that is that book. You'll end up coming inevitably uh, into a conflict between your own thoughts and thinking and the word of God. And you'll have to sit in that, inside of that tension, in that struggle. And uh, Job, you know, has, has some terrible things happen inside of his life that God allowed to happen. And he can't wrap his mind around why it's happened. And he questions God on it like many of us would if those things ever happened to us. He questions God. His friends and him get together and his friends start saying, well, God allowed that to happen for this reason. Well, God is thinking this. This is who God is. This is who you are. And starts giving Job all these answers that we end up finding out aren't correct. This guy, Elihu, comes along and uh, he gets a little bit closer to the truth. He rebukes Job and rebukes Job's friends. And he starts talking about God's justice and greatness and majesty. And then we get to chapter 38, where the Lord answers Job. And man, this, this might be one of those chapters where I read in the Bible and I'm just left silent. Much like Job is at the end. I'm just going to read a little bit of it until I think you'll get the gist pretty quickly. And I know we already read some of it, but 
Uh, the Lord answers Job, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band? The Lord continues on this vein. He, he continues on even into chapter 40. The Lord says in verse 2, Shall fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Now, I think you get the gist of, of God's response to Job there. You can go on through the rest of 38 and 39 because God relentlessly uh, doesn't stop. But notice when you read that what God isn't doing, he doesn't come before Job and explain everything that he's ever done and ever will do and the reasoning behind it. He doesn't come before Job and do that because ultimately, remember, God's thoughts and ways are so far beyond Job's and ours that Job couldn't comprehend and grasp that. So he asked them pretty much if you boiled it down, one simple thing, Job, who are you? Another way to put it would be, God tells Job, humble yourself. Humble yourself. I believe that's the answer to recapturing faith, to humble ourselves, to realize who God is and realize who we are. I had a pastor growing up. Uh, I went to Central Presbyterian Church in Downingtown. I had a pastor there. Pastor Arsog used to say, it's not great faith in God. It's faith in a great God. Notice the greatness wasn't put on us and our ability to do anything, the greatness is simply on him. It's not about you, your comprehension, your reasoning, your thinking, your abilities. It's simply faith in a God who is so much greater and so much beyond our own thinking, our own ways, our own understanding that it should draw us to be left in awe and wonder. And here's the kicker with all of that, that our God, who is so majestic, so powerful, so righteous, so beyond our, our comprehension, he's not, and, and, and we're, we're so feeble and small, is not a God who says, humble yourself and stay away from me. He's a God who says, humble yourself and draw near. Cling to me, to my goodness, to my strength. Have faith in me. Me. Our God does not stay distant from us. Despite how great and majestic he is and weak and small we are, he does not stay distant from us, but yet constantly pursues us each and every day through the life, the death, and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And the gift of the Holy Spirit to those whose faith is in him. And yet all we have to do is come before him and humble ourselves. I want to wrap up with this, with Jesus hitting, I believe, on the same point in the book of Matthew. Jesus uh, is actually questioned by the disciples. Who is the greatest? This is Matthew 18. The disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, as Jesus calls him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like, a chil like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Become like a child. Become humble like a child. I remember there was a period of time in elementary school where uh, kind of uncommonly for an elementary school, I was, I was devoted to, to loving and following Jesus. Sadly, middle school and high school, as things went on, I, I, I fell away from them, some of that. But I remember uh, being at Bradford Heights Elementary School and, 
in Downingtown. I remember going to the library in school there and finding the couple Bible books they did have and reading them. And I remember going home and for a series of nights, I laid in my twin size bed, right? Not very big, a twin size bed. And I would sleep completely pushed to one side of it against the wall. The reason was I wanted to leave that other side for Jesus to sleep in. And it's kind of cute, right, to think back on that and the the naive innocence of it. But now, at the place I'm in, in my life now, I so desperately want to get back to that kind of childlike faith. I was not bogged down by my own reasoning or understanding. I just simply knew that Jesus wanted to be with me and I wanted to be with him. That's all it was. That was that humbleness of a child. In one sense, I know Jesus a a lot more now. And in another sense, I knew him even greater and more intimately as a humble child. And so I desperately want to get back to that. And I encourage you to seek to do the same. So church, closing with this, as we leave here this week, will we seek to drop all obsession and and, and devotion towards our own understanding, our own abilities and thoughts, our own thinking. Be a people who humble ourselves as children, crawl up into the mighty arms of a God that we cannot comprehend, a God we cannot grasp. Spend time enjoying His Word, talking with Him, listening to Him, And be a child and sit with him for no other reason than he is who he is and we are who we are. Will you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you never give up on us. That though it might take years for us to learn one simple thing that you are trying to share with us, Lord, you never give up. And so, Lord, I pray that as a body, Lord, that even if faith is one of those basic tenets, God, that each day we would strive to, to humble ourselves as children, to come before you, to sit in things that might be uncomfortable, things we face in this world that we don't have answers to and understand and say, you know what, I'm going to sit in this. I have no idea what's going on, yet, Lord, I know that you are great. I know that you are good. I know that you are powerful. I know you love me, and I have faith in that and that alone. And so come whatever may, whatever I can't understand, whatever I face, Lord, I am a child in your lap. Lord, would you seek, would we seek to to have our hearts changed to become again like children and to allow ourselves to be known and loved by you like children, Lord. We ask this all in your name. Amen.